Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me extend a warm welcome to all of you to the Circa Monthly Expert Talk for the month of December. Circa Monthly Expert Talk series is a monthly feature, as we all know, where we present national and international experts who speak on important issues related to climate change and air pollution. We all know that air pollution has an adverse impact on human health. Several past and ongoing studies have provided scientific evidence as to how air pollution affects our health. However, we have yet to come up with a comprehensive policy that explicitly focuses on safeguarding health from the harmful effects of air pollution. Centering health in air pollution policy means prioritizing and focusing on the impact of air pollution on human health when developing or implementing or evaluating policies related to air quality. Now, this approach recognizes that the primary concern of addressing air pollution is the protection and promotion of public health. Some of the key aspects of what it means to center health and air pollution policy includes health impact assessment or setting health-based standards, monitoring health indicators, a public health education, community engagement, and integrating health in urban planning and collaboration across the sectors. By centering health in air pollution policy, governments and organizations can work towards creating sustainable, effective, and equitable solutions that not only address environmental concerns, but also prioritize the well-being of individuals and communities. <clears throat> Today, we are delighted to have with us uh, Dr. Bhargav Krishna, fellow at the Sustainable Futures Collaborative, who will be speaking on what would it mean to center health in air pollution policy. In this talk, Krishna would talk about as to how public health practitioners have been calling for health to be central to air pollution policy making, but the articulation of what that means in practice has remained unclear. Facilitating such a shift will require a fundamental rethinking of the ways in which we develop and implement air pollution policy. Moreover, it will also require bolstering of the epidemiological evidence uh, to support a health-based centered air pollution strategy. In this talk, uh, Bhargav will outline the governance shifts necessary to facilitate this transition using examples from his recent work and outline what it would take to support a health-centered air pollution strategy in the Indian policy context. Dr. Bhargav Krishna is a fellow and member of the founding team at the Sustainable Futures Collaborative and in independent research organization that examines the frontier issues within the climate change, the energy transition, and environmental challenges in India and globally. Bhargav's research interests span areas of health policy, environmental policy, and environmental epidemiology with a focus on the impact of air quality and climate change on health. Previously, Bhargav worked with the Center for Policy Research and the Public Health Foundation of India for over a decade. He has served on the Union and State Government Expert Committees on Air Pollution, Sustainable Development and Critically Polluted Areas and holds a doctoral and a graduate degree from Harvard University and King's College London, respectively. Let me once again extend a warm welcome to you, Dr. Bhargav, and request you to proceed with your talk. Over to you. Thank you so much, Hemanshi, for the, the kind introduction and the important context setting remarks to, to begin this conversation. Let me share my screen and we can get started. Uh, can everybody see what I'm sharing? Yes. Okay, great. So let me get going then. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today to, to talk about uh, something that I think is, is deeply important to discuss, particularly from the perspective of how we plan and implement air pollution policy, but also uh, a challenge posed to me by a, by a former colleague in a sense that um, health advocates largely talk about the need, but the question of how to actually put that into practice is something that we've been perhaps not so clear in articulating. So this talk will, will be a slightly different take than most of you who are in the audience today are used to, uh, in that it's not a traditional environmental management perspective that we'll bring to this, but bring in a more holistic picture on how do you actually do this. So to walk you through the, the agenda today, I'll, I'll 
I'll talk briefly about some of the history and the context and policy shifts that have brought us to this particular position. I'll talk about what is the health frame, quote unquote, in air pollution policy and what does that mean in practice? And for this, I'll use a couple of examples uh, from recent as well as past work. Um, and lastly, I'll, I'll talk about how does this change the way in which we view air pollution policy going forward? What does that mean from a governance perspective? What does that mean from a policy making perspective? And to begin, Again, I'll, I'll sort of walk you through a couple of statements that I think are important to, to get out of the way to begin with. So the first is health has always been the basis of air pollution action. You read any law or regarding air pollution anywhere in the world, you read the preamble or the, the statement of objects and reasons uh, of our own Air Act or Environmental Protection Act, the primacy of protecting the, pub, the health of the public and broader population is the rationale for the existence of all of these laws. How that gets translated into policy, of course, is a very different question. The second is health data has been fundamental really to improvements in air quality around the world. New evidence that has been published um, across the world on, on impacts on mortality and morbidity, associations with various diseases, has been driving change on improvements in air quality wherever you are in the world, including here in India. And the third is not making health central to policy making, not just on environmental issues, but across other issues as well, leads to poor outcomes overall. And this is not something that I'll deep, deep dive into on the, in this particular conversation, but I think you just need to see the impact that other sectors have on health to understand why health has to be fundamental to policy making across the board. Uh, to take a couple of examples, the impact of trade and access to medicines has been deeply covered. The impact of, of policies around agriculture and how that affects nutrition outcomes has been widely covered as well. And the area perhaps where it's been less well studied is, is on how placing health fundamentally in, in environmental policy making can have a similar impact in driving discourse around uh, environmental policy more broadly. So to go back to the first point, health being fundamental to action. Uh, if we go all the way back to Donora, Pennsylvania in 1948, where one of the first large scale smog events were recorded um, uh, in, a, in an industrial town that was primarily known for producing steel and zinc. Um, 20 people died in a, in a smog event in December 1948 in this town uh, and several hundred in a very small town of, of a few thousand um, located a few, uh, about 20, 30 miles outside of Pittsburgh died during this particular event. And it really catalyzed a wave of environmentalism in the US leading to the, the passing of the, the Clean Air Act. Um, and it's before that, the, the Air Abatement Act in 1955. Similarly, in the UK, we all know of the very famous London, London smog of 1952, which catalyzed a wave of research as well that supported the need for, for action around air pollution. Uh, just a couple of studies, for instance, published uh, based on this particular seminal event in, in air pollution history, uh, one on the left, which was published in 1990, which talked about some 4,000 odd deaths, catalyzed not only a wave of research, but a new series of methods that, that contributed to a greater understanding of how air quality affects health and subsequent research, which then characterized exactly how many people were likely to have died during this particular smog event. Um, and so the, the rationale in both of these cases, as well as elsewhere in the world, has been the fact that health impacts uh, and mitigating health impacts has been the rationale for designing air pollution policy that is relevant to addressing those issues. So that brings us to our particular context in India, where we are right now, and I don't need to, to educate this particular audience on any data related to this, is that air pollution in, in this country, and especially within the indo gangetic plain, is hazardous throughout the, throughout the year. Areas in the IGP often uh, exceed WHO guidelines by 10 to 50 times um, uh, acceptable levels, and even our own NACs are not met as frequently as we would like to. Um, improvements have been made over the last few years. There has been some progress, about 10, 15% improvements in, in, in PM 2.5 levels, for instance, but those gains are still marginal because we have a very high baseline effect that's acting in that particular situation. Action has been largely city focused and rural air pollution has been ignored apart from the, 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 the issuance of the Pratan Mantri Ujwala Yojana, which catalyzed access to, to clean cook stoves as well as LPG around um, in different parts of the country and to 90 million households. On the health side, we have a fairly substantial health evidence base now, and it's continuing to grow every day with a number of new studies that have been carried out across different parts of the country. Um, what we have as a result of that is 1.5 million deaths and understanding that there are 
approximately 1.5 million deaths annually occurring in India, primarily through cardiovascular and cerebrovascular illnesses uh, contributed by air pollution. Uh, we now have a wealth of local evidence across the life course. So starting from in utero to old age, we have evidence from studies that have been conducted in India. And this was primarily an issue uh, uh, with respect to policymakers and policymaking in the country where the idea that model studies can't be the basis for evidence and, and policy in this country and that we need local evidence where well, we now have it from pregnancy outcomes and low birth weight studies conducted in South India as well as by colleagues at IIT Delhi. We have evidence on chronic respiratory, cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. Um, we have exposure, we have um, evidence on chronic exposures and, and progression of cardiovascular diseases as well. Uh, and we have uh, a number of new studies that have come out over the last few years, which have measured the impact of short-term exposures or changes in exposure to air pollution and, and mortality in different cities. So studies conducted by myself, by colleagues at IIT Delhi, at BHU and elsewhere. So we have a, a fairly strong evidence base and that's only continues to grow every day because there are now probably a dozen different large scale studies going on in different parts of the country, which are trying to characterize different aspects of the link between air pollution and health outcomes. So what has changed in the policy landscape over the last five to seven years? So we have one substantially increased awareness. There's a lot more conversation around air pollution happening over the, uh, over especially the, the winter months. Uh, air pollution has become a regular part of conversation, not just in Delhi, but in other parts of the country as well, especially as you're seeing, uh, for instance, this year, the, the smog event in Mumbai, uh, air pollution being talked about in other parts of the country. We have a much in expanded policy space, you finally have a national clean air program and it's associated city action plans for 132 cities around the country. There's substantially increased monitoring capacity, places which did not have any kind of monitors at all, any, time, any kind of continuous air quality monitors at all uh, previously uh, across these 132 cities now have monitors. And this is a, an important step in that we are creating data where it didn't exist before. And Alongside that, alongside regulatory monitors, low cost sensors, which have been piloted across uh, many different parts of the country have really rapidly expanded our ability to monitor both urban hotspots as well as uncovered rural and peri-urban areas. So we have a greater understanding of how, where, and how much air pollution people are being exposed to. Um, and we've also had in this time creation of new institutions and sort of the central institution within all of that, at least from our own perspective, sitting here in the IGP is the, the Commission on Air Quality Management, which was set up through an act of parliament. And it's the first real institution which is tasked with managing air quality at the level of airships. Um, and it's a, it's a significant step in that it recognizes that air quality isn't something that's contained within cities, but requires action uh, in a, in a regional perspective. And now we have pilots going on in different states, uh, which are looking at air shared management, but within the, the boundaries of state governments, um, also happening, supported by various institutions. And we have substantial funding that has been committed. Uh, so the 15th Finance Commission allocated some 4,400 crores to, to 40 odd million plus cities around the country, uh, specifically to tackle air quality. We also have sectoral funding that is enhanced substantially to address both the proliferation of electric vehicles, both two and four wheeler, as well as um, to address uh, crop residue burning and management of, of crop residue. So if I were to characterize the policy response, I'll, I'll bucket it under three, three buckets. So the first is um, PIL driven and ad hoc, and this largely covers the, the late 90s, early 2000s, where you had the CNG transition, relocating of industries uh, fr from within NCT to outside of NCT, um, shutting down of polluting industries, specific polluting industries and thermal power plants. Um, and the, these, the, the idea is to sort of capture how we are approaching these various policy issues, right? So the second is this, uh, this selective and sectoral action that was taken on space, say, specific polluting fuels. The ban on pet coke is one such um, action that has been taken here locally. The leapfrogging to, to BS6 emissions norms um, for, for vehicles and fuel from the earlier BS4 uh, norms, which when we leapfrogged earlier than scheduled. And the, the sort of central sectoral action that has been taken across the last five, six years is the, the implementation of the Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana, uh, which has enabled access for some 90 million households to LPG stoves and some free fuels, although subsidies coming into this, to these households to purchase subsidized cylinders are, are sporadic and sometimes scarce and uh, scheduled around particular events. 
And the third is this idea that this uh, city centric action and action sometimes is also scattered on. So now we have some kind of framework that is supposed to have been developed under the NCAP uh, through these city action plans. Some of them seem to be copy paste of each other. Others are now engaged deeply in trying to understand what sources are contributing to air pollution within their own cities. But beyond that, what we've really seen is, is two types of actions, right? One is we've seen Grab being implemented regularly in Delhi, for instance, and now Grab is meant to be a part of a, an action plan for every city around the country as per NCAP. Um, but they're largely tasked with dealing winter extremes. And even though the action is linked to specific decision support systems and air quality levels, even those air quality linked cutoff points are not effective at protecting health. There's also a bunch of silver bullets that have emerged around this time, whether it be smog towers, smog guns, um, and the most recent of them, cloud seed. So what is the issue? It seems like there's a, a substantial amount of action that is happening. Uh, much has changed over the last five to seven years. We've raised awareness, we've invested in monitoring, we've had all of these different policy inputs that have been uh, happening. We have money that has been committed to cities. We have action plans that are in place. All of these things are happening. So what is it that um, public health people are complaining about? And the single sentence that kind of captures this, captures this is that the health frame, quote unquote, is missing from this kind of policy. So what do I mean by this? The there are three aspects to this, right? And um, Sagnik, who's a member of Circa, and I have co-authored a piece uh, last year, which talked about some of this with, with other colleagues. Essentially, there are three aspects. First is that the understanding of what health science is and how do you utilize health science to build environmental policy is really lacking in this country, especially within the policy circles. The second is the bar for what is evidence uh, of of health impacts is set unreasonably high. There's uh, calls for only causal evidence necessary to tackle air pollution, and that's really not how epidemiology works. And so it's it also represents a misunderstanding of how a different science that you are not part of works. And the third is that how you would be able to aid this lack of understanding is by having health expertise, especially epidemiological expertise present in key committees that are discussing some of these issues, and that really isn't present either. And so, what you have as a result of that is that the actions that have been planned and implemented don't really take account of what the health impacts are or what health needs are. So I'll give a few examples. First is the, the NCAP focus shift uh, from PM 2.5 to PM 10. Now, partly this is out of a, a lack of an adequate baseline for 2017, uh, but there's ways to, ways to get around this. And so moving from a, a, a smaller particle PM 2.5 to a coarser particle PM 10, means that you're shifting entirely your policy focus from fine particles to dust. And that results in a whole other series of actions which don't address most of the sources that are actually contributing to those particles that are most harmful to health. The second is the NACs uh, in India, although they're currently being revised uh, and have been under revision for the last year and a half or two years, are substantially more relaxed than what the WHO, the US EPA, the European Union, and other agencies consider as acceptable for human exposure. The third, Environmental impact assessments don't really factor in any kind of um, health impacts into how they, they evaluate the impact of a project. The fourth, the CEPI index, which is the, the Comprehensive Environmental Performance Index, which evaluates whether or not um, industry should be uh, installed or allowed to operate in, in critically or severely, severely polluted areas of which we have dozens around the country, doesn't have any empirical evaluation of health in its index at all. And the last is emission standards that have been set for industry. Um, provide deep analysis for the financial and the technical aspects of, of moving from one emission standard to another, but ignore any kind of moderate health impacts at all. So I think these are just a few examples to talk about how actions that have been taken across environmental policy making do not necessarily reflect the needs for health. So the public health response to this way of environmental policy making has been as follows, right? So the first is that it's characterizing it as a health emergency, the talk about the need to, to focus on health as an issue. And that is a raising awareness aspect of it because physicians primarily also believe that because they perhaps are not taught about environmental risk factors, particularly in the medical curriculum, most Indians are also unaware. But studies have shown us since then that Indians are actually pretty aware of the fact that air pollution is harmful to you. And the most recent perhaps response to this idea that health is missing from any kind of action is that health needs to be integrated by bringing in the health ministry into conversations around environmental policy. So one example is around NCAP, for instance, where uh, 
multiple different ministries are present on ncap steering committees as well as other other fora but health ministry is really missing from this conversation altogether uh and this is from the piece that sagnik and i co-wrote but essentially what this is talking about is the fact that environmental policy exists fundamentally for protecting public health but because we are not factoring into any of these things we result we end up the end, end result is that we end up with policy that doesn't really take into address the health outcomes that we need so for public health professionals the challenge has been that we've been good at articulating the need for a health focus but bad at explaining what that actually looks like so and this is really a principle right so focus on health as the primary metric of of progress or focus on health as a as a means for environmental policy making is a normative principle but how do you turn that into a actionable framework for policy so um sagnik and i co-wrote this piece in the hindu last year the goal of it essentially is that we are talking about how do you turn uh, health from a, a facet to a feature to eventually a function of air pollution policy making and we we walk through this a little bit i'll leave the link uh, with hemanchi and others if in case you want to read it but the gist of it is that we are essentially the first step is what most public health professionals are asking for right now which is a seat at the table so if we were to take health as the focus of air pollution policy and we were to traverse this route uh, going from health being a facet to a feature to a function the first step would be getting a seat at the table so if we are developing policy around air pollution a health sector representative preferably an epidemiologist must be present at the table the second is that health evidence must be factored into policy making and the third is this is a little bit more out there we are currently looking at progress on air pollution primarily on ambient concentrations but what if we were to turn health and health impacts or health benefits as the metric for measuring progress so i'll walk you through a couple of examples now to see how we think we can turn this principle into practice and one of them is new one of them is a little dated uh, the first one i'd like to talk about is a, is a piece of work um a former colleague abine and i published recently on the nax review um so how do we give the nax a, a quote unquote healthy foundation so just from a principles perspective what are air quality standards air quality standards are health based standards that define the ambient concentration of air pollution to which the public can be exposed without suffering harm to their health so there the words are right there right it's it's primarily health based standards and so uh, the question is are the nacs really health based or are they standards of convenience or the prevalent situation so for instance in india we hear about the fact that the baseline level of ambient air pollution is already so high that we can't really do much and set much more ambitious targets because the natural air pollution that is already prevalent in the atmosphere is not going to go away so in that case are we really setting standards that are health based or are we setting standards that are based on whatever situation already exists and are we really being ambitious in how we're doing this and how can the standards that we set better reflect the health evidence so on the right is just a schematic which talks about the the different times at which the the nacs were reviewed and what pollutants were included um and what kind of areas were covered as part of the the nax now to set air quality standards we need a bunch of first principles right so the first is that air quality standards must be regularly updated to stay in line with the knowledge locally and globally now if i go back to the previous slide we can see that the first standard was set in 1982 they were revised in 1994 12 years later a new pollutant was added in 1998 so let's assume that that was just an addendum but between 1994 and 2009 we had no new standards that's 15 years and then onwards now we are in 2009 uh, that was the last time the standards were reviewed now we are in 2023 so that's another 14 years since the standards have been revised in this time the whole landscape of air pollution has changed we have so much more information so how do we factor in all of this knowledge if we are not doing revisions on a periodic basis the process by which they are determined has to be interdisciplinary air pollution is a deeply interdisciplinary problem it it is a socio political and an economic problem and it must reflect the nature of the problem that the composition of this committee is interdisciplinary they are primarily health based standards that is health is the foundational pillar on which they are determined it cannot be any other additional consideration beyond whether or not it protects health fourth is they must be revised revised for the defined periodicity with clearly laid out timelines and a de democratized process that allows external inputs and the last is we must all of the doing all of this would essentially bring us in line with what elsewhere around the world people are already doing um 
we don't need to necessarily align with global standards so we don't need to for instance set our air quality standards at what who considers acceptable but we still need to follow global approaches to ensure that there is some uh, synchronicity with how others are thinking about this issue as well so the if you were to break this up into into segments we'd say this is our this is our proposal for how you would do this you would have four stages in in uh, a review of an act the first is the planning the second is the science assessment the third is the policy assessment and the fourth is the rule making stage now for the purpose of this conversation i'll just talk briefly about the science assessment part of this which is the the bulk of it right this is the meat of the work that goes into defining how an act is set uh, this takes into account all of the data that we need uh, it involves all of the expertise um and it involves the the core decisions that are taken uh, to set a particular standard so our proposal for how you would do this is that you have a scientific review committee that would essentially lead this that is co-chaired by both uh, the central pollution control board as well as the indian council on medical research these are the premier organizations one task with environmental management the other task with medical research and medical science that are really the the premier institutions in their respective fields and then you have a cross section of other uh, disciplines represented in there as well but within all this you have a group of experts who are essentially leading the scientific review right so you have working groups on multiple aspects some of these are already covered under the existing nacs for instance so air quality data and modeling evaluation of advancements in monitoring methods um, are all already part of the existing nacs review but we have added a bunch of things here right so one is the integration of health evidence that is not something that's explicitly talked about in how the nacs are reviewed currently partly i'll admit because we don't have any data publicly available to talk about how they go about doing this process and the second is the the integration of benefit cost analysis with the idea that this kind of economic argument will also factor into how we think about effective policy making and policy implementation so what kind of expertise does this kind of group need so the table we list out the kind of expertise that would require for various working groups so on integration of health evidence we would need uh environmental epidemiologists exposure assessment specialists risk assessment specialists toxicologists and biostatistics now as of now uh based on conversations with various committee members none of these disciplines are represented on the group so who is actually making judgments on how uh what kind of studies are of a high enough quality what kind of data do we need to include how do you develop a um, an exposure response uh, model all of these things are things that no uh defined expertise is involved in in taking into account the same is true i mean it's probably less true of some of the other areas because we already have strong expertise in atmospheric science and environmental engineering and management uh, and these folks are regularly involved in this conversation so in particular the first working group is one where we need to deeply focus on how to be involved all of these different disciplines now we've laid out the process by which you would do this especially for the integration of the health evidence and we see that there are there are steps here that need to be met so the first is once you define what the pollutants and the health outcomes are that you want to focus on you do a selection of the relevant studies and create a database of all of the studies that are currently available both locally and globally to support your your policy making process once you've selected what the the highest quality studies are and this can only be done by domain experts not by by external experts you need to develop a concentration response function and this concentration response function is essentially what will allow you to set um a standard at say 25 with 15 or 40 you'll know where the cut off points are where the inflection points are uh with respect to health outcomes and this is the part that we really need to be deeply focusing on and for that you again you need the right kind of expertise to be able to do it so if we were to take about, take this longer drawn out process instead of a, a sort of smaller uh, more selectively chosen committee what is the process what is the result of this process going to be first we would have a nacs that is actually well designed and would be replicable easily understandable because documents would be publicly available implementable by anybody else who is involved or is who is taking up the process for the first time because you would have a process map laid out it would be time bound and it would be periodic in our work, in our work we have suggested a once in 5 year review cycle and what would being health focused have an impact on so the first is choice of pollutants so depending on what the the available evidence is on on what pollutants cause what health impacts you would potentially choose different pollutants how would you define safe levels of exposure and as a result of those safe levels of exposure your entire air quality index the cut off points within that air quality index and how you communicate health impacts change so for instance right now our health our air quality index has cut off points at 50 or 100 talking about good and moderate air quality days our moderate air quality days are already 
10 times worse than what the WHO considers an acceptable air quality day. So are we really doing anything to protect health at all in this context? It would also, I think, indicate that the NACs are in some cases aspirational with interim targets as part of a long-term strategy. We don't need to meet the NACs within five years or three years. We need to have a long-term strategy to meet the NACs that are actually much more ambitious, but set interim targets along the way with a longer-term strategy to meet that. So moving on to the second example, this is a little dated, but enshrines a lot of the core principles that I'm talking about. And this is the, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Steering Committee on Air Pollution, which released this report in, in 2015. So talk about how interesting this committee was. It was the first ever committee set up by a Ministry of Health anywhere in the world to outline a strategy that is health center to reduce air pollution. It comprised sectoral experts from a bunch of different disciplines and civil society organizations, as well as representatives of, of various government departments, uh, including new and renewable energy, transport, industry, environment, of course, and charted out a, a long-term strategy with a key difference. And we'll get into what that is uh, in subsequent slides. But the, the talk of, to talk about this report is to identify what its primary motivation was, that, which is to identify pathways to reduce the public health burden arising from air pollution exposure. It's not just to reduce air pollution exposure generally, it's to reduce the public health burden associated with air pollution exposure. And how we define words and terms within this context is really important. That's the point I'm trying to get to. So how did this approach air pollution in a different way? So if this is the, the sort of standard environmental health pathway that we talk about where um, emissions are released from a particular source that concentrate in the atmosphere that then people are exposed to, um, and the dose that is inhaled essentially leads to health effects, right? And the, the natural point at which we intervene generally in, in air pollution policy making is on the middle of this pathway, which is on the concentration. So we measure what ambient concentration of air pollution is. We try to do source apportionment of that air pollution that has been measured and identify that this, this, this XYZ sources are contributing to this ambient concentration. And then we develop a strategy to address all of those sources. But that rests on a principle understanding that what is present in the atmosphere is exactly what people are breathing in or how much of that they are breathing in is basically how it's distributed in the atmosphere, right? So that's not necessarily the case. And based on data that we've seen on and identifying intake fractions, for instance, so how much of a, of a source that emits a particular pollutant is breathed in by an individual as part of that exposure and turns into a dose, we know that sources that are proximate to people are far more important than sources that are located much further away. So for instance, for me sitting here in my home right now, if I'm using a polluting cook stove in my home, if there's trash burning outside my home, if I'm located next to a major roadway, those are sources that are most relevant. And so thinking about it from a population level, population weighted exposure perspective, may perhaps be a different way and a better way of thinking about how do you prioritize action? We, under, we all understand that um, finances are limited, ability to implement is limited. So how do you go about prioritizing which sources to, to address? You address those sources that are contributing the greatest to exposure overall, not just to ambient concentration. And you address those sources which are more harmful to human health. So for instance, dust sources may be less harmful than combustion related sources. So the recommendations of this committee also followed this principle of minimizing the public health burden, not just reducing air pollution. So prioritize those sources that are causing the greatest exposure. So we know that exposure to pollutants from different sources is differential. Sectoral actions that were highlighted by this committee also reflected this understanding that intake fraction from different sources is different. And so it prioritized interventions primarily on cook stoves, on transport emissions, and on biomass burning. So cook stoves is fairly straightforward to understand. Household air pollution exposure is, is widely prevalent even now in spite of the Pradhan Mantri Ochoa Yojana. And the, the populations that are most deeply affected by that are pregnant women and children. And you're talking about tens of millions of households that are continuing to be exposed to that. In fact, the publication of this report and advocacy around it eventually led to the creation of the Pradhan Mantri Ochoa Yojana. But this kind of approach is also more challenging in some ways to implement than a traditional approach which just apportions all of the sources based on ambient concentration uh, because all of the sources that we're talking about here, cook stores are located within homes, transport emissions are line sources, much harder to, to control apart from say regulating tailpipe emissions, but implementations, checks and balances around transport emissions are deeply complicated. You can't have 
you can't be flagging on every car to see whether it meets emission norms, whether it has a POC sticker, whether it even um, is running an older generation of engine or fuel. Uh, these are sort of impractical, right? And the same with biomass burning as well. We are in winter in Delhi now, where there's going to be a lot of biomass burning locally as people try to keep warm. So it's difficult to regulate or control, but perhaps these are the challenges that we need to set for ourselves. So to close, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the takeaways from this, right? So centering health and air pollution policy was the, the conversation that I wanted to get started here. And primarily it is a, going to be a little bit provocative in the sense that it, it takes away from, it or sort of sets a, it departs a little bit from conventional thinking about how we're talking about health impacts, how we're talking about air pollution policy making, how we're talking about strategizing which sources to, to focus on. And so it is going to be a deeply complicated thing to implement. But the important and heartening thing is we already have the expertise necessary to do so within our country. So we have excellent global expertise present in globally qualified expertise present in India on, on environmental management, atmospheric science, bunch of related disciplines, but also on environmental epidemiology, on other health sciences, on economics. Um, these are all experts that are already present and working within this country. Some of the most pioneering work in environmental epidemiology is coming out of India at this point in time. We also have a pretty good idea of how we could put this into practice. And so we have two examples here, but operationalizing this kind of approach to thinking about policy is not, the, the approach may not be complicated, the outcome may be complicated, but the how to put this into practice is not something that we'd, we'd have much problem doing right now. What would this meaningfully, meaningfully change? So approaching air pollution control through this perspective would substantially change how we craft our policy. So, Imagine for a moment you are crafting an NCAP 2.0, uh, a next edition of NCAP that would uh, come after the, the end of the current NCAP period. How would you choose which pollutants you want to talk to? So evidence published um, by, by folks at IIT Delhi and elsewhere are already talking about the fact that black carbon, ammonia, and nitrates, and this reflects evidence around the globe, are far more harmful to health than, than just PM 2.5 as a, as, a, as a whole. So perhaps we would have to move away from this concept that PM equitoxicity is a thing and that this is the principle that comes from countries largely that only have one or two sources, which are also primarily combustion sources and not really dust. And by perhaps taking a PM equitoxicity angle, we are minimizing the potential health harms associated with combustion in this country. So would we instead choose to monitor black carbon, ammonia, and nitrates and instead focus on sources that are releasing those? Um, this would then mean also an NCAP 2.0 would have to shift focus on, on what kind of control mechanisms it's looking at. Uh, control mechanisms could mean um, emissions, new emission standards for industries or new approach to industrial regulation, but also simultaneously uh, greater engagement with cities and municipalities and thinking about how do you actually implement some of these more uh, complex controls and regulatory um, policies on diffuse sources present within cities. Our AQI cutoffs would be substantially different from where they are right now. And we have to have much more stringent grab measures that kick in much more, uh, much earlier than they do right now. So our, our earliest uh, and perhaps slightly from the strong perspective, um, actions that are implemented at scale really kick in when grab um, hits the level of the AQI hits the poor level. Uh, our poor level is already, as I talked about, substantially weaker than what it is elsewhere around the world. So our grab measures would actually kick in at much lower exposure levels. Um, and lastly, I think our markers of progress would be very different to where they are right now. Now imagine a world where you would actually make the, the marker of progress for, for air pollution, the, the health and economic benefits accrued from mitigating it. That would be a substantially different way of thinking about it, but it would be perhaps more relevant because that's why those policies exist in the first place. Um, it's not going to be easy, but it's going to be a, a, perhaps a much more relevant, much more focused, much more thoughtfully crafted policy that would actually try to address some of these issues going forward. So I'll, I'll stop with that and happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhaga, for uh, sharing very insightful presentation and uh, sharing your experience, research, and thoughts with us. And so the, we have a couple of questions in chat box. So our first question uh, is, can, de can the development of consciousness of the people lead to a greater health and as well as lower air pollution? Uh, sure, but I think what we already know from uh, surveys that have been conducted by different agencies is that awareness around air pollution and its health harms have actually in increased substantially over the last several years. 
uh, whether it leads to lower air pollution as a result of that, I think making that connection is is perhaps a little bit more challenging at an individual level. And ultimately, I think air pollution is a is a public good, and tackling air pollution needs to be approached from that particular way, which is that it has to be state led action, not necessarily individually focused actions. Our uh, next question uh, is from Dr. Ramya. How efficient is the NCAP program? <laughs> I think this is this is probably the, the word efficient is the, the the core aspect of this. I think it's efficient in that it is hot. It has really made cities think about air quality much more deliberatively. That would probably be the greatest success of the NCAP in that each city as that is part of the NCAP, the 132 odd cities that are part of NCAP have had to deeply think about air pollution, what sources are contributing to air pollution in those respective cities and formulate some kind of action plan. Uh, NCAP could have been much more efficient if it had continued focusing on PM 2.5, but the shift to a PM 10 as, as the metric of progress, because as I mentioned of this lack of an adequate baseline for 2017, means that you have probably witnessed a whole host of different policies primarily focused around us than you would have otherwise. You would probably have witnessed a lot more focus on combustion sources. What we see instead now is a, a lot of focus on controlling dust, road dust, construction dust instead. Okay, the next question uh, is the, uh, the standard of evidence that are used in air pollution management policies are multiple and often contains different evidence. In such scenario, what could help? More science or a role of boundary organizations like perhaps CPCP or PSA office that can synthesize existing evidence and provide input for policy? Right, so the, the purpose of, so in, let me characterize this with respect to the NACS, right? because that is the, the important uh, process through which health evidence is actually documented, characterized, and made sense of. Everywhere else around the world, uh, I, let me give an example of the US EPA, for instance. There is, a, uh, there is a scientific advisory committee which is tasked primarily with reviewing the latest uh, data on health impacts. And this is a long, long process. It's not a short process. The committee sits over a period of two and a half, three years, reviews all of the data, latest evidence that has been published, and determines whether or not a revision in standards is necessary. Now, these are experts who are working with a regulatory agency to try and understand how to move the policy needle. Now, that kind of thing mitigates any need for, say, contestation, because this committee, committee is by its very nature interdisciplinary. Its composition is, is wide ranging and changes every five to seven years. Um, and this process ensures that at any point of time during the review, if you do need the latest evidence that is available right at hand. So. This is the role of that scientific advisory committee, the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, is synthesizing and, and providing input. And so that would kind of mitigate the need for any additional agency to do that if we were to put this into practice. Okay, next question is even though there are vivid evidence about how stubble burning is adding on to this matter, then why don't we have a stricter uh, prohibition in this regard in GRAP even up to phase four? So, I mean, CRB is a much more complicated issue to get into. I don't know if we want to spend so much time talking about that. But I think what I say is that prohibition is not a way that you're going to get rid of crop residue burning. You have to figure out the, the economic incentives as well as the long-term transition that is necessary to move farmers away from not just the practice of crop residue burning, but the, the diversification of cropping patterns itself within that region. Um, so it's... Simply saying that GRAP4 exists and you have a much more stringent uh, prohibition of, of crop residue burning is not going to stop farmers from burning crops. We've seen that time and again not work. So it needs to be a different way of approaching this problem. Okay, next question is, are there any good examples of similar scientific review in other areas, especially something effective affecting health? So see, that's the question is from Santosh. Santosh, do you want to elaborate on this? Because I, um, I'm trying to understand where you're coming from because this the the question of uh, scientific review, especially with respect to affecting health, primarily the NACS review will be based on um, our review of, of how other agencies approach this idea of collating evidence and making sense of it. So is there something specific that you had in mind? Oh, in India. <laughs> in India, mm, good question. Uh, I mean, it would probably be a first in some ways. Um, I think on the health side, there is probably a better um, characterization of some of this when it comes to developing policy, but I would say that that's probably a, a uniform thing 
across different sectors and not necessarily doing comprehensive scientific reviews when it comes to developing policy. So perhaps this would be a first first um, means to do that. Uh, another question from him. Uh, with the WHO guidelines, it feels like levels are impossibly low, oh, sorry, uh, low and almost making them useless as guide for policy. What do you think is a good way to interpret the guidelines and being 10 times of it or worse? So, uh, <laughs> seems like we're just having a conversation. No, I think the, the WHO guidelines are indicative of a, they're more a statement of, of um, the health sector saying that there is no safe level of exposure to air pollution, right? And I think it's it's trying to put it into, into monitoring terms, what it means uh, from a health perspective, which is that what we've seen from around the world is that even extremely low levels of exposure to air pollution, especially in Canada, the US and Western Europe, levels below eight micrograms, there have been significant impacts observed in, in elderly populations. So the WHO guidelines are basically their way of saying that there is no safe level. And I understand that not being able to meet it 93% of the world doesn't meet those guidelines right now. Is it really even useful at this point? I think the point is that it sets a goal for other sectors and that this is what we essentially need to teach. Even if it is unreachable, it's okay, but you at least need to work towards it. So you have interim air quality guidelines that, that you can meet, you can set for yourself based on these WHO guidelines. Uh, we are not even close to those right now. So the question is, how are we even going to get close to that before thinking about reaching the WHO guidelines? Which is why I said, even in the in the next review, that the standards don't necessarily need to be aligned with how the WHO needs to think about it or, the, or with how the WHO thinks about it, but the, the process needs to be aligned. We can reach a different conclusion following the same process based on what our prevailing conditions are and still be satisfied with the fact that we have done a good job of identifying what the lowest possible level is that we can reach. Um, it doesn't need to be the level that the WHO has defined. Um, so being 10x is good as a talking point. I think it continues raising raising red flags because saying that you're 10x worse than something is a, is a good advocacy talking point. Uh, one more question from him. Uh, is it worthwhile to do a systematic review of health impacts by particle composition? Is it the <laughs> literature already at a place where can they can guide policy? So other countries do have a, a fairly um, well-fleshed out uh, review of health impacts by particle composition. Um, we are still in the early stages of that and partly because I think particle measurements or particle component measurements are a little bit more complicated than just simply measuring PM2.5, right? We can have a conversation offline about this, but I don't, perhaps not at the stage where it can already guide policy, but I think we need, we are not going to be that far away from that. Okay, uh, so next question is, how much policies and programs reach at action level to reduce the air pollution? Could you repeat that? Uh, how much policies and programs reach at action level to reduce the air pollution? Uh, how much policies and programs reach at action level? So I think you already see it in action to some extent, right? I think under NCAP, you see that uh, a policy decision has been taken to reduce PM10 uh, by 20 to 30% from 2017 baseline. And you see a range of actions that have been taken around that. So the fact that you, if you live in Delhi, you see uh, trucks sprinkling water, uh, driving around the streets, smog guns implemented at certain construction sites. Uh, all of these different things are reflective of the fact that that policy is being implemented. Shutdown of construction sites during grab phases is also associated with that. Whether or not that is actually effective or useful is a, is a different question altogether. But those actions are being taken to some extent. Okay, next question. What are your thoughts on utilizing an air purifier? Is it capable of overcoming these problems? Uh, I can't tell whether that is a question about outdoor or indoor air purifiers. If you're using an indoor air purifier with a well-sealed room, I'm sure it is beneficial for your own health. Um, uh, outdoor air purifiers are, are not particularly useful for anything uh, apart from spending a lot of money without having any real impact. In fact, we've seen the DPCC release, uh, the IIT Bombay report on the, the efficacy of the, the outdoor air purifier or smog tower, as it's called, installed at Connaught Place. And what we see is that the report talks about how this is a, a great new expedition, which has done a great job at installing this air purifier, but the actual efficacy of the air purifier is minuscule. Um, and based on their own calculations uh, of how effective it is, uh, which is minuscule reductions in air pollution within a half a kilometer radius, we'd need millions of these around, around Delhi to be any kind of effective. And each one of these costs 25 to 30 crores. 
you're essentially talking about one DTCC budget every year to install one air purifier, which is uh, kind of crazy to think about. Okay, uh, so next question is making a disease calendar. One such was made by PJ Chandigarh by mapping the prevalent diseases across the year in particular area and also aligning them with uh, farming season uh, or prominent practices such as residential burning in that area could be a good way of initiating a policy dialogue. Uh, perhaps I'm not aware of what a disease calendar is, but I'm, I'll, I'll check it out for sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are products of biomass combustion uh, likely to be substantially less toxic than those of fossil fuel combustion? If yes, and what does this mean for prioritizing sources? We'll probably have to do a little bit more digging into that, but both do emit black carbon, which is particularly harmful. Uh, so it's unlikely that it will be substantially less toxic in any way. Uh, but the differences in toxicity level across uh, combustion particles from, from biomass versus fossil fuel, we'll have to do a deeper dive into that for sure. Uh, are there any other sources in which health focus action to tackle air pollution can be advocated for in po political space saturated by other issues? Perhaps it goes into a more complicated question around uh, political salience of air pollution itself. Uh, it's a complicated one. I don't know if there is necessarily space for discourse around health-focused actions on air pollution, but I think taking the end result of what a health-focused action on air pollution would look like and turning it and flipping it on its head and then turning it into a policy prescription might be a useful way of thinking about it. So if you take crop residue burning, for instance, the, the solution so far has been management of stubble in situ or ex situ through provision of various equipment or through creation of new supply chains and new uses for crop residue. Um, but think for a second, if you were to take health as the metric there, um, and perhaps even water uh, scarcity as the, the metric of progress there, you would think about it in a very different way. You would think about whether um, rice and wheat are really the crops that should be growing, especially rice in a water stressed region. Rice, um, a primarily rice and wheat based diet contributes heavily to India's excessive burden of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Um, the prescription of uh, rice and wheat being primarily distributed through a public distribution system means that you're only proliferating this issue much further than before. So the question is, if you were to transition crops and integrate different, more healthy, more nutritionally sensitive, more climate sensitive and resilient and more relevant from a water scarcity perspective crops into this um, particular system, you would have system level effects that you would not be able to otherwise see. And so that would be thinking about a transition away. So this has already done this, for instance, with its millet mission, where it's um, managed with great success, uh, implementing a transition away from paddy to millets in, in, a, in all of its districts at different stages of implementation, of course. Uh, but essentially, it's a health-focused implementation because they've also thought about the supply chain and making available millets to especially school children to begin with. And so improving the nutritional nutritional quality of the diet uh, and longer-term health outcomes associated with that, while also addressing the, the same kind of issues that exist with growing paddy in Punjab, which is water scarcity, uh, potential stubble burning, which is also happening in, in areas like Gurdasan Chhattisgarh. Right? So you're having a very different uh, health outcome but primarily based on protecting health in some ways. Okay, in the interest of time, we'll be taking last question of this session. Uh, okay, the next question, do you think the first step would be coming up with the country-specific concentration response curves and using currently available risk curves, GBT, we might come up with marginal reduction in health burdens uh, due to plateauing the, of curves at higher concentration, uh, especially in daily NCR, unless we reduce PM by at least 50%. So country-specific concentration response curves are certainly something that we need to come up with, Kritika. I think we have uh, enough evidence to be able to do that both for chronic and, and, and acute exposures right now. Um, GBD has a very high bar for what it considers evidence that is worthy of being integrated into each review. I think some Indian studies are now being integrated into that, but not uh, studies that are looking at ambient air pollution as much. Um, so that will probably change with the next revision, which is due in the next couple of years or so. But uh, right now, at least, it doesn't really take into account as many Indian studies as we would like. Um, but we might come up with marginal reduction in health burdens, specifically in Delhi and CR. Yes, the, the marginal reduction is true. I think we have a um, couple of studies, at least from um, 
the GeoHealth group, which you are also a part of, um, as well as uh, studies on short-term exposure and mortality, which show that there is a plateauing of effects after a particular concentration. And so we are the way we are approaching this, if you have to take the health lens, we are really addressing the right tail of the distribution. We are not really looking at where the majority of the health impacts are occurring, which is much below what we consider acceptable levels right now. Okay, uh, so moving to our uh, vote of thanks part. So uh, I, on behalf of Sarka IT Delhi, I want to extend my sincere thanks to Dr. Bhaga for accepting our invitation to deliver this talk. And it was a pleasure to host you as our expert talk speaker this month. And we appreciate for uh, Dr. Bhaga for sharing his insights and expertise and shedding light on the critical need of central health in air pollution policies. And we also thanks all the participants for make, for your attention and thanks Thank you for being part of conversation and make the interactive through Q&A session. And we will announce our next scheduled talk via social media handles very soon. Stay tuned for more impactful events in the future. Thank you and have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Bhargav. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks. you, Rachi. Thank you. Thanks.